blah. Um, it does actually kind of lead your eye through the picture plane following those light values. We tend to go to the light values first. Um, bad image of Guernica. Where, but, but Picasso chose to do this pan, painting of the Spanish Civil War in just black and white, thinking that that graphic imagery, well, I don't know what he thought, but uh, uh, we tend to read things in black and white as the truth, and I think it's because so much of our text is in black and white. We automatically accept it, and then we find out later it was wrong. Um, Matisse's gr granddaughter, Sophie Matisse, has repainted Guernica in strong chroma colors. Got it. Um, and it changes the it, meaning completely. It becomes this party with cows and bulls and people dying and whatever. And then there's a woman, um, and you guys are probably old enough to remember, when I first started teaching color, um, I read this article in the Kansas City Star about a woman who worked for an interior design firm out of Phoenix, and, or Arizona, and she was hired to decorate hotel lobbies in the Midwest, and she chose Guernica for the rooms because it had cows, and she thought that was a very Midwestern image, not <laughs> thinking that this is all about death and destruction and the horrors of war. So it was a, I always bring it in my lectures to students, this is why you're taking art history. You don't want to be that person. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, this is Johannes Itten, who was at the Bauhaus in the early 1900s with Vasily Kandinsky and Joseph, uh, what's Albert? Paul Clay, Walter Gropius, the architect, um, Mies van der Rohe later. And um, here, when you squint your eyes and look at it, there's really not much value change. So it can be effective you know, with a huge range of value, also with not much at all, depending on what artists are trying to say here. This is also fairly strong in chroma, things that look pretty bright. Um, so in this case, rather than um, showing depth or three-dimensional form, your eye tends to go to the white shape, just because it's so totally different than all the colors. And then um, moving through here, so it creates a path of visual movement. It may not that much of your can show. Um, so the third dimension of color is uh, chroma. And when I say it's a dimension of color, what we're saying is that um, every, everything that is a color, even this red pencil, has a certain aspect of hue. It's red. Uh, value, this is kind of medium value, and chroma, which is really strong in chroma, means pretty bright. Uh, and when the uh, Cubis, well, Picasso and Brock particularly chose not to use strong chroma. So this is really weak chroma overall, thinking that they could suggest more with form without that diversion of strong chroma, because chroma is the attention getter, and it will attract attention, particularly strong chroma, in any design. So you can use it really effectively, and that's what my design students have to learn, is you can't have everything strong chroma, you just need to put it where you want the viewer to uh, grab their interest. So, um, really weak chroma overall on this one. Um, and then Paul Clay, again, one of my favorites. So that was kind of the fun part, I could look up who I wanted to. Uh, using strong chroma in the sun and also this small triangle down here to grab your attention against that weak chroma, darker background. And he seems to really like doing it because he did it also in his painting Around the Fish, which is one of my favorites. That strong chroma really grabs your attention, leads you in, and then as you start studying it more, you realize the details of the fish and um, get really involved in it. So it can be really effective as an attention getter. And then the other aspects of color um, make you pay attention and read more than the artwork or design. All contemporary color systems are, have three dimensions, and chroma is also sometimes called saturation. 
uh, sometimes brightness, sometimes intensity, so it can get kind of confusing. Um, uh, Kandinsky used a lot of strong drama. This is not I was, they didn't have one that was just really garish with drama. But what he was trying to do was replicate your sensation of listening to music. And when you listen to music, you have those simultaneous notes going on, and uh, even in chords. So Kandinsky has these multiple uh, strong chroma to grab your attention, to give you that idea that there's a lot going on there all at once. And a lot of his are called uh, improvisation or some rhapsodies, really trying to get that idea of um, the correlation between art and music. Um, I have to watch my time. I can get off on tangents pretty easy. Ken Dinsky was, uh, he was very interested in synesthesia. Any of you heard that? No? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that multi-sensory uh, experience of colors or sounds or smells. And so he wrote a lot about it. And he wrote about uh, if you saw, if you saw yellow, you might taste lemons or hear the, have the sensation of hearing trumpets. And there's a lot of people that are synesthetic, maybe about one to three percent of the population. And usually it's color and sound in some form, but they're not always the same. Someone might associate, uh, not, uh, it's not sound, it's uh, numbers or text. And they might associate the green with three. But somebody else who's synesthetic might say, oh, no, three is navy blue or whatever. But Kandinsky wrote so much about it and over several different senses. And usually people who are synesthetic only have one of those neurological pathways, um, not sound, smell, vision, color, all that. And so some people think that Kandinsky was a synesthetic wannabe because he was just uh, talking about all of it. So uh, the other thing we'll talk about briefly here is color interaction, a little bit less technical. And um, I was going to ask one of my students how to pronounce his name, and I forgot. Uh, Michel Chauvarel, who was a chemist in France in the 1700s, 1800s, he was hired by the Gobelins Tapestry Company to standardize their dyes. And tapestries were so huge at that point. And um, they were having problems getting the colors to look like these giant cartoons that they, or drawings that they were trying to reproduce. And so his job was to make the color accurate. And what he realized, it wasn't the dyes, but it was the color interaction. That um, as colors are placed next to each other, they change in appearance. And we so, so we see them differently. And this is a weaving and, um, from the Gobelins Tapestry Company, and I picked one that was kind of in uh, Chevrolet's era in the 1800s. And what you're seeing here is the same yellow throughout, but it does look different because of where it's placed and what color it's next to. So this is called a uh, Bezel Effect or Color Assimilation. There was a Czech physicist, or actually this one was a a tapestry weaver, I think, and he found that if you if you changed one color in the weaving, that the whole image would change in tonality because of the colors placed next to it. Um, so um, the other person that talked a lot about. Uh, color interaction was Jobus of Albers, who was originally at the Bauhaus in the 30s, came to the U.S. during World War II. He taught at Black Mountain College with, and his students were Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg. John Cage was there and Merce Cunningham. And so he was a big wheel there. And then he went on to Yale, which is the uh, top uh, art graduate school in the country. And in 1963, he published this book called The Interaction of Color. You probably have it in the Nelson Library. Um, and when it came out, it's this huge book. And it's got over 200 just prints, hand-printed images. 
And it's all about color relationships and how colors affect each other. And the book itself weighed about 20 pounds and it sold in 63 for about $200. And amazing, yeah, 63, imagine that. And it sold out. And so I thought I had my student version with me, which was $12.95. Uh, evidently, it's not my purse. Uh, they're still reissuing it. Now when you buy that, it's a couple thousand dollars. And so uh, at KU, we have one in the art library that you can check out. But you have to, if you check it out, you're right next to the library and you're wearing gloves. And there are individual plates or prints that you can look at. They also have another one in the Spencer Research Library that's never been unwrapped. And I, and so it has to be worth a fortune. But, but what's the point in that? Um, so it's pretty fascinating to look at, and if you ever get a chance, just look at it. He also has a little guide of what you're supposed to be looking at. And these are more of Albert's images of the homage to the square, and each time the color is interacting differently depending on what color to place next to it. Um, so this is the one, this is color assimilation of the Bezold effect. And in here, on the left, you see Computer screens are really fun. Um, you see white stripes on uh, uh, red stripes on a white background, and on the right you have the same red stripes on a black background. So, do they look different? Do they look the same? Does one look lighter? The red stripes. What do you guys think? On the white, don't they look lighter? Red. Yeah. Thinner. We're going out on a limb here. The white looks thinner. And actually, this is kind of hard to see because we're projecting it really big. In right. color assimilation, we're thinking really small areas of color. But um, also, we don't really have black. It's yeah, tan. It's but they do seem a, darker here because of that interaction. And we call it color assimilation because they're making colors more similar or right. more alike. And um, so we look at, this is from Albert's book. Um, these light violet colors are actually the same, but on the yellow background, they look lighter in value than they do on the darker violet background. Um, and, and going back for a minute. Um, so uh, they also look a little warmer on the left than they do on the right because the, uh, the warm aspect of the yellow. So you do see this a lot in print. Okay, so I finally got a print in here. Uh, Gauguin's, uh, I wrote it down, well, whatever it is, uh, Te Atua. And you see it a lot in printmaking, not just woodblock printing, but um, etching and tallyo. And they're using that spacing of line to create different values. And in here, you can see the, the lines are really far apart, but even though he still printed the same color down here, where it's interspersed with some of those black lines, it looks like it's darker in value. And it's a basic premise in printmaking that we use all the time, color assimilation. Um, another one, um, and I think it was a little easier to see in block prints. Uh, and then on Art Store, they have hundreds and hundreds of Japanese wood blocks. And I was looking at them because the Japanese wood block or block printers they use so many colors, whereas we in the Western culture will use for and hope for the bad, you know, that interaction on the print itself, creating colors or how we layer it. They've got separate colors for everything, so they don't really rely on uh, things like color assimilation. And this is, they just have 27 press rooms of you know, light green, dark green, medium green, or whatever. Um, but this one, where they're simulating rain, was kind of interesting to actually look at color assimilation. Uh, the other person that does it, uh, that you might be aware of, is Richard Ennis, Enniskevich. I always have to work on pronouncing his name. Associated with the op art movement. Uh, he's an American artist. I think he's still alive. And he does these huge paintings that look like this. And this one has color assimilation because it has really thin stripes 
and often the same color weaving in on different backgrounds. So you might see there's a kind of a dirty orange right <coughs> here, it's here, it's over here, and it starts looking more green. And there, uh, there is a book out about Anna's Kibbutz paintings, and it's, some of them also use color vibration, <coughs> which is uh, colors that are the same value, the same chroma, and they kind of make your eyes hurt to look at. So you wonder how he manages to keep doing this, or whether he's wearing sunglasses or something. Not so much, well, a little bit of color vibration in here, not much. Um, so the other type of color interaction, and um, Albers wrote a lot about it, is simultaneous contrast. And whereas in color assimilation, we use small amounts of color, they start looking more alike. In simultaneous contrast, you have a small sample, in this case, the X's on these fields. And it is uh, perceived as different than the background. And in the top one, even though these are the same color, the top one, uh, the field is weaker in chroma. And neither one of them is really dark in value on there. Um, so the top X is probably appears a little bit brighter, stronger yellow than the bottom X down here. So we have our simultaneous contrast that is changing the appearance of that color as far as chroma. So uh, what color actually are the X's then? The color, they are the same color. And they're uh, kind of a dirty, mustardy yellow. And um, you also see it here. Um, and here we have... If you squint, the, you can see them. Yeah, you can see it a little bit better. The problem with digital media is it starts to become pixelation. And you can't see it as well, and of course the colors change. But um, we talk about simultaneous contrast as pushing the colors apart. So blue and orange actually are in subtractive mixing actually are complementary colors. So this one over here starts looking that orange square starts looking more orange than that one, and that one looks a little dirtier, darker because of the color that it's on. Um, this was just a beautiful example in Albert's book, that the same color of monitor. It's kind of a light gray, violet, and how it changes on different backgrounds. So uh, you can use it really effectively if you only have a limited palette, which a lot of uh, printmakers do. And um, the other aspect of simultaneous contrast is you can actually get two colors two different colors to look alike. And so when you see this center thing right here, these are the two colors that are on here. Um, using your knowledge about simultaneous contrast, a you know, dark field will make that sample seem lighter. Um, a weak chroma background will make that sample seem stronger in chroma. So in this one, my guess is, because this is the light value background, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, that is this color, which is actually trying to make this vertical stripe a little bit darker. This color appears here because it's against a back, dark background and we perceive it as being lighter. Um, it doesn't really have a lot to do for us as artists, but designers run into that all the time because they have this multicolor background and they're flashing you know, the name across it, Renoir or whatever, and in one color, and because the background is multicolor, all of a sudden every letter in that title starts looking differently, and they don't want that. So they have to use that knowledge to correct it. Um, so, um, Chevrel talked about color, this type of color interaction, as have other um, color theorists, and Delacroix was influenced by Chevrel, and there's and Delacroix and Seurat, uh, even Van Gogh read a lot about color theory. Not that they always applied it, but Delacroix is kind of known for using simultaneous contrast. And this isn't the best example. They talk about it in those um, Odalesque paintings that he did. 
Um, so the other type of color interaction that I think is pretty pertinent to us is optical mixture. And um, we see it now in our computer prints because they're all these little dots that uh, are so small that we read them as one color. But before um, the advent of computer technology, a lot of times it was just glazes, translucent glazes. And Rembrandt was a big person's glazes. They say it used to just paint its underpainting in, in tints and shades of earth tones and then put these really translucent glazes that would glow on the surface. So uh, that optical mixture that came through the glazes, you also see it in Seurat, who read a lot of Chabrol. He also read Audubon Rood, who I won't go into. But um, So he was looking at how uh, science breaks down color and try to um, explain that, at least Rude was, explain that as far as how artists and how we see color, you know, making that correlation between Newton and what we see in subtractive mixing. So Seurat read that, and then he came up with this, and, you know, they say that Hodgkin well, and Rude would turn in his grave because he didn't anticipate this at all. But really, it's optical mixture, and you've probably seen Seurat paintings or prints, and little dots of color, often complementary colors. So there's no real brown in there. It is that optical mixture or how your eye interprets that color. A detail of Surratt's uh, Sunday afternoons, you can see, you know, here's the, the shading on one figure, but there's really not any black. There might be some darker values of blue. Oops. Um, go back a minute and just look at that. Yeah, and now you can see what the computer does to one image. Um, the odd thing when I was looking at our store, and I'll show it in a minute, that you can see you know, ten versions of this painting, and they were all slightly different in color. Um, so, contemporary artists that do this, like Chuck Close, who's done prints, he's done everything. Now he's doing, he's got some of his uh, giant heads. You guys seen them? They're amazing. And um, he's doing little abstract expressionist paintings within his grid. And they are optical mixture, that these are huge, like 12 feet tall, just the head. And then you, you, when you get close up, you might see something like this. When you stand at the end of the room, it coalesces in your eyes so you can actually make sense of that face. And now he's got some that are um, tapestries and rugs. It's kind of weird seeing, um, what was it, Philip Glass's head, or Lucas Samara's head on the floor in a rug. It was just bizarre. <laughs> Uh, but optical mixture, and it's amazing that as close as he is to that painting that he can actually visualize what you would see at a distance. Um, so just a little bit about pigments. Uh, this is lapis lazuli, and as I said before, a lot of the early artists, art theories were based on the importance of the pigment. Lapis lazuli comes primarily from Afghanistan, and, which has always been hard to get to, so it's very expensive. And that kind of blue was generally used for royalty or people who were very rich. And this painting by Michelangelo is in fresco. He hated oil painting. Um, it's not finished because the client didn't either fork up the money for the blue robe of the Virgin or somehow that shipment didn't come through or whatever because it was supposed to be lapis lazuli there. Um, we've since replaced some of those pigments with, well, particularly lapis lazuli, French ultramarine blue. Um, this one is um, iodine scarlet. Uh, it, it's really strong, brilliant red. And Turner, uh, iodine scarlet was only used briefly, really briefly, like a matter of a couple of years. But Turner, uh, is kind of known for his, I'll use the <coughs> color that's on my palette. And so uh, he was painting this painting and used iodine scarlet right in here for that brilliant red streak of the sunset. Iodine scarlet was uh, just brilliant red, opaque, a wonderful color, but it changed colors when it interacted with metals and metallic pigments. So within a matter of weeks, it's completely different. And Turner's paintings are known for that. 
that you never know what Turner intended because weeks later it would have changed completely. Um, but they're still beautiful. Um, so in the 18, um, I think this is 1857, something like that, J.C. LeBlanc decided, well, he tried to invent four-color process printing. And what he tried to do was put down a press run of yellow, one of blue, one of red, and come up with the final print. And we can do that now, but in the mid-1800s,